I just wanted, actually, just to get back to guitar playing. I hadn't really played for a long time. Um, Bernard Butler, who's my partner on the record, a guitarist used to be in Suede, um, we ran into each other at a party a couple of years ago and I think we both realised we were in a similar space. I'd been running the label for 10 years, he'd been in the studio producing people for 10 years, and we both suddenly thought, it'd be great to play guitar again, wouldn't it? And that's kind of how we came together. Um, and our styles complement each other really well. I play very kind of open tuned, folky, kind of jazzy, impressionistic style. And he's a much bluesier, grittier, overdriven kind of sound. And the two really express the lyrics and, and marry very well on the record. So that's sort of how it came about. The week before I was due to start recording the album, uh, last September, um, I was at a party in London to do with my book. Um, and it was mainly people from the book world. He happened to be in the room and we were introduced as two musicians. And he was incredibly friendly and in the middle of the conversation, completely unexpectedly, he said, uh, would you like to hear my demos? Which is not kind of what you expect to hear from Pink Floyd's David Gilmour. Um, but he was serious and texted me a couple of days later and said, I'd love to get together and just talk about music. And so I went down to his house on the south coast. We spent the day together. Um, you know, listened to music, had some lunch, chatted, got on really well. And a couple of weeks later I was recording my album, I was doing this one particular track and I thought he would sound great on it. And I just texted him and said, how about it? And he said, sure. And it was done within a couple of days. No managers, no offices. Occasionally I think about doing um, one of the songs I used to sing in Everything But The Girl, but I don't know, it always feels a little bit like I'm kind of two-timing Tracy by playing it in my solo set. But really, she ought to be there on the stage next to me when I do it. So it depends what mood I'm in. Occasionally, I've slipped in, you know, 25th of December or The Road or something, which I used songs I used to sing solo in the band, but it feels kind of strange. I think she feels, and she's quite right, that she feels it is important that I establish myself doing you know, this, this solo thing, if that's what I really want to do. And if I'm to get anywhere doing it on my own, I kind of have to do it with my own stuff. And in the same way that we don't choose to lean heavily on our past, you know, I don't think it's right for me to do that either. Um, we're pretty happy in the space that we are now. We've both got solo careers. We're not trapped by that whole nostalgia machine of, of pop, you know, which would automatically be placed back on our shoulders if we came back out as everything but the girl. Um, but you know, she's made three solo albums, she's writing a second book at the moment. Um, there's a kind of freedom to what we do and um, it's just nice that we have an audience for it. It's a kind of um, commercialised monster in a way and you know, I can see its, its appeal but I mean, one of the things that offended me the most was the actual conflation of all these kind of underground electronic styles, most of which, you know, had been born in America in the first place. Um, the thing that irritated me was that people didn't seem to have the, the, the attention span or the good grace to actually recognize these forms for what they were, and instead they just lumped them all into one great big melting pot and called it EDM, you know. Uh, you know, house, techno, you know, hip hop, disco, all these things, they, they deserve their respect. So um, that was one of the things that put me off at the beginning. But I think it's, you know, it is, these days it's about spectacle, you know, which is the antithesis of underground club music. Um, it's, a, it's like a Pink Floyd show, you know, it's flying pigs, it's lights, it's loud music and flashing lights, and it's, you know, it's, it's got a place, you know, if, if kids weren't buying it, it wouldn't be there. But I don't think it, it has very much connection to the kind of club music that I respond to. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's my place to, to particularly say it shouldn't be there. It'll probably find its own, you know, level and then 
disappear or, or, or stay the course. It was difficult and you know when I first came across the, the box of love letters that had been in my brother's loft for a long period of time, I didn't realise quite what a kind of emotional gold mine that it was. And one letter in particular, which is I talk about in the book, was sealed up and said private for Tom only, my dad. It was from my mum to my dad. But my dad had just died and I had to make this decision. You know, do I open it? Do I burn it? Do I, you know, adhere to my mum's wishes? Uh, would I have a better relationship with her if I were to open it and read it? And it lay unopened on my desk for three days before I could decide what to do. And in the end, I decided to open it. And I was so pleased that I did because it gave me such an insight into their relationship and made me more sympathetic towards them, made me realise that they were flawed, you know, and that um, there's a lot of pressure on us to see our parents in a heroic light, you know, they're, they're there to be proud of us, we're supposed to respect them, they're these massive figures that we've been in our lives since childhood. But also I think you have to see your parents as being flawed, you know, as just being people who have big issues in their life, even when they're bringing you up. Personal issues, depression, you know, self-esteem, all this kind of stuff. It affects people at 40, 60, 80, you know, and I think when you start to see your parents in that light, you see the human scale and suddenly you think, well, they did their best, perhaps, you know.